Hi, I'm Bruce C.T. Wright. I'm the managing editor of NewsOne.com. And here's our truth. Racism is literally destroying us. But the injustices are layered. Every day, many of us go to work in spaces where we're passed over for promotions, subjected to racially insensitive commentary, and are paid less for the same work. Many companies are finally talking change, and we're talking how. News One has partnered with 100 Black men of America to present solutions from corporate America, how brands are using their voice to empower Black communities. This discussion is part of a series on the impact of corporate support against injustice and the anti-racism movement. Please watch, join the conversation, and stay connected to News One, and share your thoughts by following us on Facebook at News One Official, Twitter at News One, and Instagram at News One underscore official. And keep watching. Hi, everyone. Welcome to part one of Solutions from Corporate America, a three-part virtual conversation series with corporate leaders and executives uh, working with brands and prominent companies that are using their voices to advocate on behalf of black, the Black community. I am your moderator, Jason Rosario. I'm the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at BBDO. And I'm also the founder of The Lives of Men, a social impact agency focused on masculinity, mental health, and culture. And it's a true, true honor today to partner with News One and 100 Black Men of America to facilitate this conversation because it's, it's an important one. And I've spent my entire career trying to build spaces and create pathways to success for people that look like us. And so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have that conversation with two amazing individuals. Um, and so I'm gonna bring them in right now. Uh, the first is Ivy Grant, who's the Vice President and Chief of Staff at Twilio, and my good brother, Patrick Walsh, Vice President and General Manager at Foot Action. So uh, before I pass it along to them, I just want to acknowledge something that's incredibly important and timely, and that is we all know what the decision that came down was regarding Bianca Taylor and her murderers. And so I want to acknowledge that this conversation is taking place within that context. And so while we may all be feeling uh, a variety of different emotions and might be feeling heavy and frustrated and angry, uh, I want us to know, I want you all to know and remind you that we are a powerful community and we are a resilient community. And so I hope that this conversation in particular just helps you to rem remind that, rem remember that, and to carry that forward. So with that said, I'm gonna bring in my amazing co-panelists here. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Ivy. If you can share with us a little bit about who you are and your work. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. Um, my name again is Ivy Grant. I am the Chief of Staff and Vice President at Twilio, so I'm Chief of Staff to the CEO. Um, but I have to say that I've been in that role for exactly two weeks now. <laughs> Prior to that, I was uh, the vice president and chief of staff of customer care for Walmart. So um, when we think about companies that are really truly trying to engage around racial justice right now, I think Walmart is one of those that's trying to be at the forefront of that, um, doing good things and some things that we have to kind of work on. But I think um, it's been for me a really interesting journey to see how they've been changing in, in pulling that, those things in and to, to see the differences and how a company as fast growing uh, as Twilio is also trying to embed those kinds of changes in their organization. Thank you for that, Ivy. How about you, Patrick? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Patrick Walsh. I'm the Vice President General Manager at Foot Action. Uh, you know, I'm new into my role, not as new as Ivy, of course. Uh, I've been in a role since the, uh, since the beginning of the year. And then prior to that, you know, I, I, I you know, I probably spent about 14 years as a marketer. Right? I was the, uh, the vice president of marketing at uh, for Foot Locker in North America. And before that, I was the vice president of marketing of Champs. Um, and then before that, I was the CMO of, uh, of a smaller competitor uh, called Villa. So, you know, a lot of years, um, you know, in the sneaker industry. And, um, and, and, and I think it, it's fascinating you talked about Walmart, but I think it's also fascinating thinking about the sneak industry and its relationship with uh, the black community. And then you know, prior to that, I, I, I kind of got my roots into management consulting. 
Yeah, so I share I share the two week landmark with you, Ivy. I'm I'm in the seat here at BBDO for about two weeks as well. Um, so let's get right into it because I think we have a lot to cover. And again, to remind everyone, this is the first of a three part series. So this particular conversation is focused on the impact and the value of companies stepping out in in the social sphere and and making public statements of solidarity uh, for on behalf of our community. So the first question that I have for you all is, you know, how important was it for you from your perspective for your company to say something regarding uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others and then the subsequent protests? Uh, was that something that you all thought about? Was there an internal conversation around whether or not your company in particular said something regarding those events? Ivy, you can start. I'll start. Um, when when this all started to become more acute uh, after George Floyd's death, um, I was at Walmart. And I think because I've also spent a lot of time, I used to work at a company called Edelman. So I've actually worked in communications as well. So I understand the value of um, proactive communication. So I think it was incredibly important for, from the visibility perspective for a company like Walmart that's out in the forefront, number one employer in the United States, to have something to say about these incredibly huge events. And Walmart has a long history of that, whether it comes from gun control to um, the, the more recent masks in stores. I mean, there's a, many things and people and events kind of intersect at Walmart. Um, so they really had to say something. And I think it was really incredibly important for them to put out a statement that was as, for, as forward and progressive as they did, which was not only were they going to support the movement of Black lives, but they were also going to create a fund, a massive $100 million fund that pushed towards racial equity. So for me, it, the messaging was important. The messaging is not just important for your employees to know that you care or for that people to care about it. The messaging is also important for your peers, right? Because if Walmart is willing to take a stand and there's an opportunity for some of the other people who are looking on as fast followers to Walmart and other large corporations to then take that stand as well. But I will, I will kind of say though that it's incredibly important for those words to be backed up with a clear action plan. So it's great to put a black square on your IG, but it's really important for you to then have a plan that backs that up. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah, no, Ivy, I absolutely agree. And so, you know, from my perspective, um, I thought it was absolutely important. In fact, I, I, I thought the company was obligated to make a, uh, a statement. I mean, you think about it, many of our employees are black, many of our consumers are black. Uh, some of our best products that we sell in our stores are named after black people. You know, we've got Jordans, we've got um, LeBron's, KD's, Kyrie's, uh, all named after black individuals. You look at sneaker and the streetwear culture, it's all rooted in the black experience. And so personally for me, I thought our silence would have equated to simply being complicit, right? And for too long, when it comes to black and brown individuals, we've complained about systemic racism. Uh, and typically the world respond, responds with uh, typically silence, denial, or what I like to call moving furniture. And what I mean by moving furniture, we start getting distractions, right? Whether it's a topic of black on black crime being one of the big distractions. Um, and we, we, we all saw it play out four years ago uh, with Colin Kaepernick. And so for me personally, yes, I thought the company was obligated to make a public statement of support. And uh, and I agree with Ivy, it's, it's not just the, the, the statement of support, it's the actions as well. Yeah, agreed. I think we all we can all agree that um, making sure that the back of the house is in order before you step out in these ways is, is important. And, you know, I think th th I saw something floating around the Internet and I'm not sure if you all saw it, but there's a document, I think it's a Google document, something very simple, that's keeping track of which brands are saying what, what brands are not saying anything, and what brands are not saying anything or enough of. And so I'm curious to hear from you, what was your opinion about maybe some of the brands that actually did say something, to the extent that you can comment, was there a brand that, that particularly sticks out in your mind uh, uh, for, for getting it right, you know, or maybe a brand that just maybe could have done a little bit more homework before they said something. Is there anything, any brand particularly that's, that sticks out in your mind that, that got it right? 
I'm not sure if I can if I can comment on other brands. I, I mean, I, there was a lot of kind of showy statements for a long time, a lot of shows of solidarity, a lot of fists in the air, um, fist graphics included. Um, I was I have to say, even as a Walmart employee, I was genuinely surprised by Doug McMillan's statement as CEO of Walmart particularly the language that he used to describe the situation. Because what he actually said, which is not something that I expected from him as CEO, is not, he didn't talk about the death of George Floyd. He didn't talk about unrest. He talked about the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police. And that I think was a signal in that language to the gravity of the statement, but also the clarity by which he was assessing that situation. And I think that many statements that I saw were about, you know, let's get together for change. Let's, you know, the death of, of, of George was an unfortunate incident and in these challenging times, all of those kinds of statements. I was very incredibly surprised by Doug's just clarity of statement of, you know, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police. And that's the starting message that he kind of built on. And that's for, for a company that is at the forefront of Fortune 1, Fortune 50. Um, and particularly with the relationship that Walmart has had with the Trump administration, that was a very clarifying and almost defiant statement. And I was very, very proud of Walmart at that moment. So language matters, right? And your choice language matters. definitely matters. Yeah, yeah. definitely matters. I, you know, I think it is a little early to say who did it right. I think we started the journey, which is what leads me to be optimistic, right? And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, initially I was a little pessimistic. I'm not gonna lie, a little pessimistic. And I thought, all right, maybe this is really a lot of performative allyship, right? People are looking to, to squill kind of the anger in the black community. But as I started to hear the language, Ivy, that you mentioned, right? It's at other companies. I was proud of the language that our CEO at Foot Locker had shared, Dick Johnson, right? And once I started to see these comments, what I realized was happening and gave me a reason to be optimistic was the fact that no longer do we have to bear the pain as a black community, right? It's unhealthy. And there's a health crisis in our community. And now we were starting to share that burden with the rest of the country and the rest of the world. So that gave me reason for optimism. And like I said, I think we just started. We'll see how the journey goes. And then, you know, we can look at this two, three, five years later and say who got it right. Yeah, agreed. And so as leaders, right, because this is part of the, the reason we're having this particular conversation with both of you, is that you're both in a position to influence the, the decision making and the actions taken inside of your organization. So walk us through a little bit about your thought process when something like this happens, we're, we're reacting to a cultural moment. Um, is your approach a an organizational approach or is it first or is it more of an individual kind of let me see what I can do within my purview uh, first before you go the organizational route? What, what would you say is, is your particular approach? I mean, it's it's really a bit of both. I think when, what I found myself doing the first days after, um, not just George Floyd, but after Breonna Taylor, after like was calling people and checking in. And I think as an executive in our organization, and it, for me as being one of the more senior African-American um, executives, I thought it was really important for me not just to kind of sit in meetings where we talk about a response, but actually call people up. Um, part of my role was also as part of uh, the executive sponsorship for our ARGs, our associate resource groups. So, you know, I was on a first name basis with most of the African-Americans um, in my office and many of them across the organization. And so I spent a lot of days literally just calling people and saying, are you okay? And the answer oftentimes was no. So listening, caring about people's responses, helping them through that moment, more important to me than the part where I have to kind of put on the face and go out and kind of make a, a big message in a, in a start. Because if we don't have each other's back on that level, if we're not actually making sure that we're checking into people to actually 
you know, manage their health and manage their concerns and help them actually say, if this is time to step away, even if you need to take the day off, if you need to do like do those things for your own health. I think that was the more important first response for me. And then, of course, I started getting my hands dirty in the rest of the organization. And in some cases, that wasn't even my own initiative. But you know, a lot of people were calling upon their ARGs and other other companies have employee resource groups, whether they be, um, you know, along racial and ethnicity lines or other things. But um, I think we were called to do a lot more in that time period, which I also have been counseling people on protecting their space, right? Because in some cases, there was a lot of extra extra work put on people of color to help their companies through that moment. Yeah. And so I, again, I wanted to connect with people on a very personal level to let them know that they can also say no to that if they needed to. Yeah. Yeah, Ivy, I, I, I couldn't disagree. I mean, as much as I said in the beginning that I felt that, that Foot Lock was obligated to make a statement, I feel personally it's obligated for me to actually step up and make sure that I uh, communicated what was important, right? Um, that was my role. I'm in a position, a senior position, um, and I've got to step up and make sure that I have the conversation. So, you know, one, make sure to have conversations, but also similar to what Ivy brought up in terms of leveraging our ERG, our Black ERG, making sure the members, they were good, but also making sure we created uh, platforms where they could be heard by the senior leadership. Because one of the important things in the process is to make sure there's listening happening. And in that listening, we create a, uh, we create a safe space where we can have difficult, uncomfortable conversations. Because out of those uncomfortable conversations, we can start to build a culture of empathy and then start to get on the path of action. Yeah, uh, and what I'm hearing you both say is that th these are moments oftentimes uh, and opportunities for humanizing the organization, humanizing each other uh, and talking about uh, psychological safety and, and being mindful of that. And, and how we can create psychological safety for ourselves and for each other. I think it's such an important piece that I think a lot of brands have missed in these moments, right? They, they, they rush to kind of go out and say, this is what we've done, but not enough to say, look, I just hear you. Sometimes acknowledging is, is enough. Um, I, wanna, I wanna turn the lens a little bit to, towards our clients, right? When you think about the impact of these moments uh, on your customers, what kind of how how have they been affected? Have you seen a change in the ways that you they're engaging with your brand? Um, have you seen a change in terms of how they're spending their money with your brand or not? Um, and I think I, I asked that question because in the world of we're in an era of cancel culture, where on Twitter you know it's very easy to just say you know this is not the brand you want to be messing with right now, and then all of a sudden. Um, I'm just curious to, see, to hear whether or not you've seen an impact from some of these conversations that are taking place on your specific brands. Actually, I'd like to hear Patrick's answer on this. Exactly. Not any more or less Jordans right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, honestly, uh, you know, the, the the response has been positive, right? You know, we went out there with with a few different responses and. I personally didn't know what to expect uh, from the customer, right? Um, and uh, the feedback has been positive from the consumer. The overall industry has been positive. Um, our business partners has been positive. I think that, you know, the thing that interested me, um, and I think Ivy kind of talked about this earlier in terms of the impact that the business could have in shaping the expectations of corporate behavior. Um, once we started uh, to take action and different things we did, we start to see the industry kind of copying us, right? So, you know, for instance, right after the murder of, of George Floyd, we went dark on social and we went dark for a couple of weeks. Um, it just didn't feel right to start having conversations around buy this Jordan. And, you know, we partnered with our vendors and, and delayed launches and we saw, you know, competitors start to go dark as well. Um, you know, we shut all of our stores in North America on the day of uh, George, in the celebration of George Floyd's life, right? Uh, just to give a healing moment uh, for our employees. And we started seeing co competitors try to uh, emulate a little bit of what we were doing. And so for me, it was very powerful. And we started to realize the power that we have to shape what's happening in our industry and, and, and the power that we have there. And so uh, 
for me, I, I really felt that that was powerful. And, and I think the consumer has started to change a little bit their expectation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's all public. You know, we, we did have a strong Q2. I'd like to believe that some of that also had to do with the response that we had. Um, but most importantly, I, I was really just happy with the fact that uh, we started to use our voice to shift what's happening and, and how people engage with, with, with our consumer. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, it's funny because Walmart is a 24 hour operation and um, there's no stop in that train. But what is, <laughs> what is interesting around, you know, we've had a lot of layered things and we can kind of assess and look at the responses that customers have had to various issues um, and compare them to ones that we've seen before. So for example, um, huge amount of discussion from customers calling 1-800-WALMART or talking to their store employees when gun control happened and we made the decision that we were not going to be selling ammo and high powered rifles and all those things before. Um, we have not had the same, at Walmart, we did not have the same level of response and engagement around George Floyd, but where we saw it was in particular categories of merchandise. Mm -hmm. So you suddenly saw a huge outcry about why we were still, well, like, are we selling Confederate merchandise and can we stop doing that? We put the kibosh on Confederate merchandise, but then there was a second outcry from another, from other places that said, well, you guys are selling Black Lives Matter merchandise how come you can't sell Confederate merchandise? And can we, like, how do we make that happen? And remembering that Walmart isn't just Walmart itself. When we're talking about online sales, we have a tremendous marketplace business where we sell third party merchandise and we don't have as much control over what that merchandise is. So being able to send out new rules and regulations to hundreds of thousands of vendors is a crazy, uh, thing to have to do, but it was really important for us to ensure one, we are not going to pull Black Lives Matter merchandise off the, off the stores because Black Lives Matter is not hate speech. It's not a hate group. It's none of those things. Um, and we are going to pull Confederate merchandise off of those those shelves and those counters because we felt that those are that was actually inspiring and driving some of the unrest around the organization and around the world. So I think those are the kinds of decisions that Walmart is finding themselves struck with, which is a much more challenging environment of looking at thousands and thousands of pieces of merchandise and products and making decisions that will impact not just yourself and your sales like minutely, but maybe the life's blood of a small business that is putting their merchandise on your project, on, the, on your, uh, your site. But it is an incredibly important thing for us to take stands on those kinds of areas because it, you know, it's important to our employees. It's important every day. Um, I think it's incredibly challenging to make those things work in the e-commerce setting, but you have to, you have to start making those rules and those policies somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and I want to come to you on this one, Patrick, and, and eventually I'll, I'll love to hear from you as well, Ivy. But I know that obviously you both, both organizations have put in place diversity and inclusion initiatives, both before these issues occur, definitely after they occur. And Patrick, I know that you've done a lot uh, at Foot Locker and, and Foot Action around voting for Gen Z, you know, raising awareness around that, um, providing scholarships to young people uh, impacted by COVID. So can you tell us a little bit about those initiatives and how they've been impacted um, given, given the landscape that we're living in today? Yeah, no, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, you know, it, I, I feel like we're really fortunate that we plant a lot of seeds before everything happened, right? And so you heard me earlier talk about the Black ERG that we have. And we also have Latinx ERG. Uh, so we're able to get, um, you know, we're able to have our Black and Hispanic employees have a voice. Um, additionally, you know, we, we started with our DIBS training, a diversity, inclusion, and belonging training uh, earlier in 2019. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, we also last year in the beginning of 19, we started to to roll out what we call community stores. And and, and what community stores are, it's it's basically your flagship stores, right? And and we had opened up flagship a couple of flagship stores before, and, and we realized immediately that wasn't the right strategy to put these flagship stores um in big tourist areas. And so we flipped it. If we're really going to empower youth culture, then we need to really serve them in their communities. And so 
starting last year, we started to open up community stores, these big flagship stores, 10,000, 15,000 square feet. But we opened them up on eight miles in Detroit. We opened up in Philly. We opened up on 181st Street in Washington Heights in New York. We opened up in Compton. So essentially, you've got our best, the best expression of our business that are in these neighborhoods. I don't know how many brands um, in the country, in the U.S., can say that their best stores are on 8 Mile, Washington Heights, or in Compton, right? And so not only do we create beautiful stores, but we also hired locally in those stores. And we also partner with local entrepreneurs, Black and Hispanic designers, to put their products in the store so we can support them and their business as they grow as entrepreneurs. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we also started to make investments in um, an organization like Pencil. And Pencil is, uh, was started by a guy by the name of uh, Dwayne Edwards. He was a former Jordan designer. And um, he left because he realized there weren't enough black designers and Hispanic designers in the marketplace. And so he wanted to create a company that could actually uh, develop a more diverse pipeline and provide that training. And in early in 2019, Foot Locker Inc., made a significant investment in this company because we believed in this cause. Um, you know, we also, you mentioned the scholarship program. You know, we've had a long ongoing scholarship program and one of our partners is the United Negro College Fund. And what we've been able to do is we've decided, okay, well, let's now start to expand the number of scholarships that we're providing to black students. And then the other program we mentioned was Rock the Vote Partnership. That was something that I was working on with Rock the Vote last year. And, uh, and as a result of, you know, incubating that conversation and that discussion, knowing that we need to play a key role in making sure that youth were able to vote and understanding that there'd be more than 4 million youth who would be eligible to vote for the first time this year. That only 46% of those between the age of 18 and 29 actually voted in the last election. We need to do something about it. And as a result, we just made the announcement uh, last week that we've opened more than, we've turned more than 2,000 of our stores in the US and transformed those into voter registration sites so that we can make sure that consumers can easily go into our store, check to see if they're registered, register to vote and sign up for, uh, uh, for reminders so we can make sure they do, sh they do vote leading up to election day and actually on the election day. So, you know, I think we're fortunate to have a lot of programs in place and you know, what we've done is we've, we've, we've put out a mission, a social action plan where we're going to commit $200 million to the black community in the next five years. But a lot of that is going to be rooted into academics um, and, and economic empowerment and really leaning into some of the programs that I, that I just talked about. That's awesome. That's, that's the work, right? That is exactly the work, not just to talk about the work. I actually want to say I, I congratulate you, Patrick, for because that's the kind of work that you'd like to see a lot of corporations take. And I don't necessarily see that happening everywhere. So, I'll, I mean, I'll speak more generally, so I'll put somebody on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of places that I have worked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... I will say, look, there's there's a couple of things that are happening that feel really exciting, but also alarming to me. And so when I look around at organizations right now, I ask myself, um, one, do we have the right leadership in place to actually make real change in their organization? And I think that there is a really easy thing to kind of put in diversity, education, ERGs, all of those things that we are we think of as bread and butter in DNI work today. But I think the part that is missing from a lot of organizations is how do we then take the things that we do as our business, our core business, and link them to the goals that we have around diversity so that it doesn't just touch our employees and it doesn't just touch um it's not just embedded in some deep supplier diversity program that is run by a junior project manager, you know, 17 levels below the CEO. So I think that one, the things that Patrick, that you're describing that I think are incredibly important are connecting your business goals in terms of expansion, flagships, locations, et cetera, back to those diversity goals. So making it a part of standard business operating procedure to understand, do we have enough vendors that are black? Do we have enough or minority owned? Do we have enough? Like, how are we actually going after different customer groups? Are we just going after customer groups that are in this mainstream, et cetera, but actually making it part of your business? 
And the second piece of it on the other side that I find a little bit alarming is the internal piece, which is, again, really focused on helping create, I think it's important to help create forums for minority people and black people in particular to voice and understand their challenges and connect to each other. And I think that's incredibly important. But we did not create racism. So if, if we keep having these conversations where you try to make me feel safe, I feel safe. I'm fine. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Anybody run up on me, I'm safe. But if we do not actually create programs that touch our white counterparts, our leadership, our managers, and embed the evaluation and the performance metrics for those kinds of programs into things that actually tie to real outcomes, whether that be um, performance reviews, whether that be money, whether that be bonuses, all those things. If we do not help our white counterparts understand that this is actually a problem of how they are treating us, not how we are receiving it. If we don't actually make those changes within organizations, it's it we are we are preaching to choirs that have been singing their throats out for many many years. So I I I am challenging, and I did this at my old company, I my new company. I'm going to try to be as vocal, but challenging us to ensure that that inclusion organiz that inclusion organization is focused on the right things. And those things are not just helping Blacks, Latinos, women feel more, figure out how to navigate white spaces, but help white spaces become more welcoming to women, Blacks, Latinas, et cetera. So I think that's gonna be, and that to me is what anti-racist uh, lessons, anti-racist education is all about. It's not just about how do you make me feel good as a black employee? I can feel good at home. But like, how do you actually create an environment for me where I am heard, where I am listened to, where I'm valued, and where the things that the people around me understand that they are not bringing me into a conversation despite me being black, but they are bringing me into a conversation and I'm black. <laughs> so I just want us to, I, I love the things that Patrick is doing because I think on the other side in terms of, again, connecting it back to the core business is incredibly important. But I want to see more companies focused internally on not just helping people feel good, but actually helping people do the work that it takes to actually be a better partner, be a better employee, better be a better coworker, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Ivy, you know what? It, it's interesting you brought that up. So you know, by having our black ERG, one of the things that came out of it was the black employees were very clear and unapologetic and said, it is great to see what the organization is looking to do externally, but you also got to make sure to focus some of that energy and a lot of that energy internally. We've got some things to talk about. And uh, and I give the company credit and, and I really do give our CEO credit. He, he led with humility, as I mentioned, and uh, and he listened. And I remember right after George Floyd uh, murder, he came on one of these, these Zoom or Teams meetings, and it's him with a bunch of black ERG members who were feeling raw, and he listened, right? And he took that pain, and, and we took that same conversation, that dialogue, and had a global town hall discussion so people could understand, here's what your black coworkers are going through. You think everything is good. You think everything's happy. You think that what you saw and happened in terms of George Floyd was a one-off? No, it isn't. This is what happens outside, and this is also what happens inside. Once again, you got to build that level of empathy so that yeah. people understand the why as we start to go on that journey together in terms of having the actions in place. And I love what you talked about, Ivy, in terms of it's got to be connected with business because it is. At the end of the day, if you are not allowing your diverse employees to be heard, then you're not going to win. You're not going to succeed. At the end of the day, they have different thoughts, different ideas, and they can also protect you from making critical mistakes. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I'll add something quickly there that is just on my mind. And that is, you know, we, we often talk about representation matters, representation matters. But I think another piece that I would add to what you both said is that it, it, representation is not enough. It's how do you unlock the intersectional value that exists in that room once you have the representation in that room? And I think that is probably a conversation around allyship, probably a conversation around sponsorship. And then it just also reminds me of, of something that someone said at an earlier panel that I was on today. And that is, you know, we often talk about creating a seat, being offered a seat at the table. But who said that 
dominant culture is in a position, it's not your seat to offer me, um, right? And so I think that's also important. It's you, you know, being mindful of kind of the language and the perspective that we're using in these conversations as well. So, uh, I, I I feel like we need to also kind of push the language of representation matters forward as well, um, because. I mean, I have been invited in my career. I've started in consulting. I've worked in a lot of different organizations, mostly male dominated, mostly white. And I have been brought to the table many, many times to be the black person at the table. I've been I've been the representative. I have done it. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. But I also have always asked the question, why am I so why am I in the room? Am I in the room because you need a, a person who is brown and happens to have natural hair? Or am I in the room because you actually think I can add value to this conversation? And I think towards you know my later, more senior parts of my career, it was learning how to say no to things and telling them that it, cl it clearly means that you need to hire somebody who actually has this expertise who can sit in those rooms, as opposed to just pulling the, the most senior kind of African-American face that you can find to sit at those tables. So, and that's been, you know, that's, I think it's better now. It's always, you know, every, every year it's going to get a little bit better, but I think that we need to also start evolving our language. Yeah. Yeah. So as you, you're both leaders and as you manage diverse team um, of people that, that already have their own points of views and their own perspectives around these issues, how do you manage dissent? How do you manage disagreement about whether between say that your organization's position is, is X, but the internal feeling is Y. How do you manage that uh, as leaders? Yeah, you know, you can go either. No. <laughs> I was just gonna say, look, there's, um, I, I mentor a lot of young, particularly black professionals, and I feel really clear that I tell people all the time, look, you are smart, you are capable, you, if you, you can find someplace else to work. So ask yourself in every situation, there's kind of three criteria I look at within an organization to understand whether or not this is the time to vote with my feet or to actually dig in and try to actually take charge and make things move. The three criteria for me are one, what is the leadership saying? Like as we look around, are they making the right statements? Is there a conversation happening at the highest echelons of the organization about racial equity, about anti-racism, about the topics that I think are really important to me. Two, are the leaders that I directly report to, do I feel like their behaviors match the words of those leaders that are above them? Because it is oftentimes that there's a really great person at the top who's kind of saying all these great things, but trickle down economics doesn't work, right? So if there's not clear guidance from them down to the managers that manage you every day, that they're actually gonna have to do something different, act different, be different, read a new book. So if they're not actually behaving in a different way, if they're not reaching out in a different way, then that's a problem. And then the third thing for me, of course, is the community around me. Do I feel like my employees are getting more open about these conversations? Are they, is it more disruption in the organization because they don't wanna talk and they don't wanna have this conversation? Is, is there anger? So all those, those layers around me. And I think that you have to have at least one of those going for you if you're going to decide to stay. And so I counsel young people, look, this is an opportunity for you, particularly given that as companies are realizing that they don't have diverse workforces, they are looking for top black talent everywhere. So, I mean, I got poached from my company. <laughs> I was minding my business at my desk <laughs> and suddenly I'm working somewhere else. <laughs> so even in times like these, even given COVID and all of the changes that we're seeing in the disruption in industries and economies, there is now a time, a, a time when people are seeking women leaders, they're seeking black leaders, they want to make sure that their teams are diverse. So you have the ability to vote with your feet. But if you don't have those levels of alignment where your leaders are saying the right things, your managers are doing the right things, and the people around you, the sentiment that you're feeling around you every day makes you feel comfortable enough to do your job every day and bring the self that you want to bring to the workplace, then I tell people, if, if you have a problem with it, vote with your feet. If you have one of those things or two of them in place, depending on your criteria, 
then you can dig in and actually say, okay, how, what can I do to actually push the conversation forward? If well, I've got none of those things though, I wonder if the conversation is actually worth having and then I might vote with my feet. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I agree with you in, in terms of open communication is key. And the reason I bring it up, I, you know, it's not an if there'll be dissent, they will definitely be dissent, right? Not one company is doing it right. We're all trying to make it right. We're faking it until we make it. We're trying to figure it out. And as a result, feedback is in, is critical. And, uh, you know, once again, we talk about the, the importance of diversity, right? And diverse thought. So best believe if the company is offending its employees. And there's a high probability that the company is also offending its consumers. And uh, and so you need to make sure you have high consumer as well as high high employee engagement. To, in order to succeed as a company. And so, you know, at, at Foot Locker, you know, I talked about we have this framework, we're committing $200 million over the next five years, and it's gonna be focused on two areas. One is on education, the other is on economic empowerment. It's about us making sure that we are opening up, and from an external perspective, we're providing more access, and we're doing a much better job of operationalizing the black community into what we do as a business, providing more access to the overall value chain and knowing that, that makes great business sense because of the influence the black community and black culture has on the business. And similarly, making sure that we are making sure to provide the resources and the tools so we can develop a strong, diverse team internally. And so I say that is because it's important to be very clear on what the framework is and the response to systemic racism. No company can do everything. And so you got to be clear, and bring people along on the journey in terms of when you're defining here is our role. And then from that standpoint, you're able to then leverage the feedback you're getting from the organization uh, to actually track and maintain that open dialogue so that you can you can understand and, and measure your strategy and measure the KPIs and consistently reevaluate your strategy and your approach. It truly is an iterative process, right? Take the feedback, consistently change. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is a journey and we'd be naive to believe that we all have solved it. And so it is a journey. Got to get the feedback. Got to treat it as if it truly is an iterative uh, journey. Yeah. So speaking of journey, we're going to start landing the plane. So this is where I'm going to ask you to put your tray tables up, put your seat back in the upright position and, and really just kind of bring it down a little bit closer to home. And, and I'm just interested to hear from you all what, what your how you're dealing with this? What what? How has this impacted your your personal life, your professional life? Um, because again, we started off at the very top, uh, saying that this is a, a traumatic moment and traumatic experience, a tra traumatic year. I feel like it's month sixty seven of twenty twenty. Um, how are we navigating that? Um, you know, I'm going to be real. I have cried more in the last three months than I've cried in the last three years, hmm. and. Um, and it's interesting because I'm not just emotionally charged because of everything that's happening on the outside. Um, I think there's one, a layering effect, right? Where there's there's George For there's George Floyd, there's um, Breonna Taylor, and there's any number of named people that we are talking about every day and trying to find justice for. There's the isolation of COVID layered on top of that, where you know normally you have all these outlets for your frustrations, connecting with people, et cetera, just getting a hug. And you have that piece on top of it. And then the, the, the third one is really like your everyday interactions, given all of this stuff, with like still having to do your job every day, still having to figure those things out. And I think what it has brought up for me is, um, I realize that there are a lot of things that I have been forced to normalize that are not normal. Mm -hmm. So I have gone back and sort of things that have happened to me have come up um, that I didn't realize that I had either laughed off, brushed aside or pushed downwards that um, have been very emotionally charged. And I'll tell a brief story that I promise this is not my Oprah moment. I'm not going to cry. I don't care what you say. You are not Barbara Walters and you're not gonna make me fall out up here. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> but I will tell a brief story. So um, when I was uh, when I was I was leaving a particular job, I was looking at for a new opportunity, and I was actually recruited by 
um, I, I don't want to be too specific, but I was recruited by a large corporation to as a CEO for a mid-sized company that was part of a larger corporation. And I was really excited about the opportunity because um, it just seemed like things really clicked in terms of my background and their need. They were looking for somebody to take an organization that had been um, less than process driven, had very, very creative and help to professionalize that organization into a set of really process discipline and operations. And that is actually my specialty, that is what I do. So I was super excited about this opportunity. And I had spoken, I had had a phone call uh, with many of the people in the leadership organization, chairman of the board, um, people on the C-suite executives, and everyone was like, we're exactly right for this role. We're exactly right. And I was like, this is exciting. I'm about to be the CEO of this company. This is going to be amazing. So we had one more meeting where I had to meet uh, the chairman of the board at a restaurant. And uh, it was in Gramercy, a uh, high-end place, lovely. Uh, the hostess greeted me at the door, said, oh, yes, uh, his table's in the back, took me to the back. And I go to meet this person, and the hostess is introducing me. She's like, oh, this is, you know, Mr. So-and-so. And he looked up from his breakfast and then looked right back down. And uh, she kind of, uh, she and I were looking at each other like, what's going on? And then she calls him again and says, hey, you know, this is Ivy Grant. And he stared at me for a while and then spontaneously said, where did you come from? And I didn't even know how to answer that question. And I had this incredible moment of clarity that he did not know I was black. I have a generic name and I sound like this. <laughs> and so I was at an interview that suddenly turned into the most awkward half hour there ever was. He found a reason to leave in the middle of it and uh, step out. And I literally sat in this restaurant and like tried not to cry. I'm getting emotional just talking about it. Like tried not to cry. Like staring at the wall, trying to just find a way to like gather myself. And I never told anyone that story. I didn't tell anyone that story until this year. And I realized that part of it was that I was so incredibly hurt, but also embarrassed somehow that I had done something wrong or I, I wasn't the right thing that somebody wanted. And I had kind of taken that and internalized it onto myself until having a conversation after all these events with some girlfriends who were, I, it just, the story came out and my friend was like, that doesn't have anything to do with you. Like, why are you, like, just emotions were coming up out of this conversation. And you realize how those kinds of things that have happened to you in your career, you know, I've worked for 20 plus years and I'm sure there are many moments like that, probably not so acute as that, but I pushed down because I had to keep going, keep smiling, keep figuring it out, keep, keep on being black, you know, that's not gonna change. So I think that my, this personally, this whole time has brought up for me a tremendous amount of soul searching, but also being more free about releasing some of that stuff out of my own hands as I was clutching it to say, how could I fix this, that it's not mine to fix and to open that palm and let it go. And so this has actually been a really great time as challenging emotionally as it has been. It has actually been really freeing as well. Well, wow, thank you for sharing that, Ivy. Yeah, Ivy, thank you for sharing that story. And you know, that's kind of what I talked about earlier in terms of <clears throat> as a community, we've been holding on to that, right? We keep it inside. And that's really a lot of the cause of the health crisis that we have. And this is the time for us to not take that burden on anymore and to push it um, and let the rest of this country dive in here and do some of the, the legwork and some of the solving, right? So I, I appreciate you sharing the story. And uh, similar to you, I think we all walk around numb, right? We all try to forget, we all kind of look inside, especially you know, the more successful we are, it's because we believe that we have the the ability to change everything. And if something doesn't work, it's because of what we did. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, I guess when I think about it, 
and it's you know with everything happening in, in terms of systemic racism and and and, and the impact and, and and what we're going through right now i'm not new to this right i would say to myself i'm not new to this i i'm a product of edgemere projects in queens new york right i'm a product of the new york city public school system and when you think of public housing we think of public schools and public education those are two big pillars in this web of systemic racism in this country. And so, you know, I've, I've gone through it and I've had the explicit and the implicit forces tell me where I belong and where I don't belong, right? Being kicked out of institutions because they assumed that I shouldn't be there or being told in school that I won't be successful. Um, and so I kind of had that, I was numb to it. But there were two big things that kind of happened to me this year when I think about it at the beginning of this year in my life. Uh, one, the birth of my son. And it was my first child, right? He's eight months old. And as a result of his birth and going through this time, it's forced me to do what Ivy talked about, right? I'm no longer being as numb. I'm thinking about the experiences. I'm thinking of the pain that I experience, right? Because of what I look like. And it hurts me because I'm thinking, I don't want my son who shares my name to have those same experiences. And it hurts me, right? And I think of how can the world be better for him? And I look at things in a much different lens. And then the second thing is that I mentioned, I, I took on a new role as the GM of Foot Action. And in that role, I realized that I have, I have a, um, an obligation to navigate a team, right? This organization through this time. And I've got to force those difficult conversations that we have so we can have the conversations, build the empathy and make sure we're taking action and make sure that from our business, we are an example of what the, org the whole entire company needs to do. And as an example, we talked about Rock the Vote. That was a foot action thing only, but it built into being the entire company in the US participating. So, um, so you know, it's tough. Um, you know, recent experiences have, have, have forced me to actually come to grips with some of the stuff that I've dealt with in the past, but also lean in and see what can I do to be a part of uh, about part of change and be an agent for change. Yeah, wow. well, thank you, Ivy and Patrick for sharing. And what I, my, my takeaway, or I guess my, the way I'm processing it is that I'm in a state of purposeful rage. Um, purposeful because it's very easy to be angry. It's very easy to be upset every moment of the day because it just feels like every turn, there's something new to consider. So um, purposeful in that, I'm just tra channeling that energy into positive, healing, constructive activities to the, the best that I can. And that's what I'm going to leave the audience with today. You know, you all heard um, kind of just how these amazing individuals and amazing leaders are navigating these moments from their vantage point inside of their organizations. You've heard how they're dealing with this personally. And so I think it's important that we all remember what I said at the top that, you know, these are these are moments that are extraordinary and uh, and remind you not to normalize things that you should not be normalizing. So with that said, thank you, Ivy. Thank you, Patrick, for joining me in this conversation. Um, for everyone listening, I invite you to join us for part two of Solutions from Corporate America. Uh, we're going to bring to you another set of amazing individuals. Again, I just want to shout out News One and uh, 100 Black Men of America for hosting us and for having us engage in this dialogue. And so on behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having us. Good night.